But what protection mechanisms exist to defend our UFI variables? There are multiple protection mechanisms, which we can mainly divide into two sections per attack resistance. There are software uh, attack resistance uh, protection mechanism and uh, hardware attack resistance protection mechanism. We would like to not talk too much in, uh, about hardware attack protection mechanism, uh, just to mention a couple uh, on this slide. Software protection mechanism will be explored uh, more widely in further part of the of the course. So let's start uh, with hardware integrity protection mechanism. Uh, first is uh, reply protected memory block partition, which is supported by some hardware devices like NVMe, uh, universal, universal flash storage or EMMC. So this RPMB uh, is typically used in combination with uh, trusted execution environment. It works in a way that uh, that during the manufacturing process of the storage, there is RPMB key generated, um, which is fused into one-time programmable fuses. And uh, this key can be then used to access data which are stored in um, RPMB partition. And this key can be used only from the trusted execution environment. To even improve the uh, security of RPMB, uh, there is also reply protected monotonic counter, which also has its own key uh, fused in OTP and it is used to uh, avoid rep reply uh, attacks. Other means which can be used to protect against hardware attacks and like protecting our UFI variables against hardware attacks is storing those UFI variables in TPM, CSME, um, uh, in hardware su uh, support, uh, hardware security module, um, or other type of uh, secure storage. So interestingly, UFI designers uh, in the specification considered such use case, and, and we will talk about that later, despite those rarely met in, in real life. From the availability protection, uh, hardware availability protection mechanism, we have two here. First is atos atomicity. It is guaranteed by the hardware uh, because NOR flash designs guarantee atomicity of, of writing uh, one byte. Uh, but of course, to write whole UFI variable, we need the implementation of correct I update flow, um, which is already part of EDK2 implementation. So it kind of uh, works for us in, in background uh, by default. There is also a fault tolerant write. Uh, so it may happen that uh, that attacker may try to do power loss uh, in the middle of the uh, UFI variable update to, to break our security. And it is already implemented also in EDK2 as a driver, but it has, it's a separate uh, driver which have to be enabled to, to, to work uh, in default compilation. What, what it does, what, it, what this fault tolerant write driver really does is just tracking uh, precisely uh, what uh, write transaction sent to our uh, SPI or to other storage that stores UFI variables uh, are completed and only based on, on that uh, decide if the whole variable was written or not. And then if something happened in the middle, um, we are sure that not whole variable uh, was written to the storage. And last technique uh, is used for confide confidentiality protection, for hardware confidentiality protection. Um, this te technique helps, uh, help, helps, helps us on not only storing the variables as in case of um, integrity protection, not only storing in TPM, CSME, or, or other protected storage, but storing encrypted version of the UFI variables. So the question is how we decrypt the, those encrypted variable. Uh, we can decrypt it either by user means, uh, which means providing password during boot or some fingerprint or some USB token, or by platform means, uh, which can be, for example, a secret which is unsealed uh, from the TPM after PCRs in TPM will be correctly uh, populated. Yeah, and that's it from, from hardware perspective. And now we can talk about resisting software attacks and, uh, and protecting integrity, availability and conf confidentiality using uh, software attack uh, resistance. So let's start with a mechanism that can help us resist uh, software attacks on UFI variables. 
and and uh, let's start with uh, confidentiality protection we already discussed that uh, as a part of the hardware part of the protection uh, but the point here is that the, also the software part so the way that user provides um, the password or the the content for generating key uh, also have to be protected and of course that's up to the uh, implementer in the uh, in the UFI. Then let's jump to the availability protection uh, because availability protection is uh, built in EDK2 and, and we can say it's uh, technology just would just work uh, in, in background. We can say that uh, this, this can be safely omitted and we will not talk much about that. Of course, both fl flash wear out protection as well as uh, quota management uh, implementations could be interesting areas for researchers looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, but uh, th those are not meant to be used by firmware developers in, in kind of regular everyday development workflow. And, and we think that integrity protection and, and variable authentication is, is way more important and way often used. So uh, let's, let's go to integrity protection mechanism uh, as, as the means of um, defending against software attacks. So main and most used and most popular and, and the one which will be widely discussed in this course is uh, variable authentication. Th this mechanism is for ensuring that entity which calls UFI runtime services uh, function set variables, which is used for setting the and updating the content of the variable uh, has the authority to really do that uh, operation. There are various authentication mechanisms uh, to prove that, and we will discuss those authentication me mechanisms on the next slides. Um, the second integrity protection mechanism is, is accessing and updating uh, variables through trusted execution environment, which in case of x86 is a system management mode. And it's just, it works in a way and the belief is that if we do the access to the variables in tightly controlled and isolated uh, environment, it improves protection. Of course, this method is fine uh, as long as, as we like uh, system management mode and, and we, we trust in, uh, in system management mode implementation. Of, there are some platforms which does not support S SMM and there are some designs uh, and threat, mo threat models, we just don't want SMM to be uh, part of the, uh, of the platform. So in such case, implementation which is already done in EDK2 and is default implementation to handle um, UFI variables updates um, cannot be used. So someone have to implement his own. Other mechanism is a lock or variable lock. Um, it may happen that some variables should not be changed after some boot stage. Uh, so typically those variables are like uh, uh, configuration related to memory training or for example, some stuff related to system man management uh, mode memory. And uh, those uh, configuration uh, options or uh, configuration parameters can be locked. And after those will be locked, uh, they cannot be changed um, until reboot. Finally, there are also sanity checks. Sanity checks help make sure that a variable can get only valid value. Typically, this is done in BIOS setup menu when we go to setup menu and want to set given value, give, give some data to, to the given uh, variable, and then BIOS setup menu validates if this is a correct value, if this is in range, if this is not below minimum or over maximum, and so on. If if um, it is, then it does not allow us update the variable in such way. And uh, in this in this course, we are mostly focusing, as I said, on variable authentication, and we will also uh, talk a little bit about uh, updating variables.